How are you guys doing? Doing well? Cool. Keeping up your attendance in the grade book? <clears throat> if you guys are going to chit chat, you're kind of close to the microphone. I'll ask you to maybe move to those chairs right there. I appreciate you helping each other, but uh, they'll just be picking up here. Do it. It was cool. You got two chairs, one there, one there. You can just slide on over and keep working. It's not a reprimand. It's just a video production quality issue. You guys can talk all you want. Back in the corner. <laughs> uh, Jose, welcome. Glad to see you. How's it going? Cool. How are you? Pretty good. Right on. Uh, so I wish that web programming was like, uh, it takes a lot to wrap your head around it. And uh, I've been entrusted, and somehow it's just been my career, right, that people have said, know this and teach it. And then I'm getting paid to sort of spend all my time when I'm working, or a vast majority of it, just focused on web dev. And as part of that process, you know, uh, put together and went through a 10-week summer boot camp, one week HTML, uh, three weeks JavaScript, two weeks web components, and, uh, and then four weeks Go server-side programming. Ten weeks, 40 hours a week. That's 400 hours of instruction. 400 hours of instruction. And I'm not the only person who went through it. <coughs> right? Uh, some of the guys in this room went through it. And none of us are banging out awesome, beautiful websites. And we, we went through 400 hours of instruction. Whoa. So this is a, this is a, a niche that you know, is its own specialty and its own expertise. And it takes a lot to sort of get everything working and to wrap your head around the entire deal from the front to the back. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, <coughs> server-side, networking, debugging, right? So it's a, it's a pretty big deal to wrap your head around it. When I asked Caleb, you know, did you learn all this stuff? And Caleb was our trainer for the four weeks of Go at the Summer Web Boot Camp. When I asked him, did they teach you all this stuff when you went and got your degree in comp sci? He's like, no, I learned all this on my own, right? It's just like, okay, he, he, he studied comp sci, but then he became interested in this. <coughs> and, uh, and that's where he put his efforts. And, you know, I guess he learned it all, or a lot of it on his own. So I just wanted to sort of reiterate that so you guys know sor sort of the lay of the land and you have the correct expectations. Um, that said, try to give you as much uh, material and resources as possible. So if this is something that resonates with you, you could really pursue it. And I've, I've got good pathways and good learning materials for you. So one of them is here at our syllabus. <coughs> and to get to the syllabus, if you're watching this video online, fudgy die. <laughs> Google and then all that and you'll be brought to this syllabus and uh, once you're at the syllabus you know there's the resources up there but I just want to illustrate this resource right here because I went back to that just today in preparation for today's lecture to look at some of the stuff and so if you click on that link you're taken to uh, all of the videos uh, for go just four weeks just for the four weeks of the boot camp these are all the videos that Caleb did so there's a, a link of a bunch of resources up at the top, but here is a description of each video that he did and, uh, and a link to the video, right? So the first week, day one, two, three, four, five, the first week was uh, all the language, and then week six, we started to get into web stuff, right? So we did TCP and then some Go testing. And, uh, and then we started building our servers and serve mucks and serving files and templates. And then we looked at queries. So we were looking at query strings last week. And then we did cookies and sessions and HTTPS. How do you do HTTPS? So we'll be looking at cookies, sessions, and HTTPS today. But if you find yourself wanting to know more, you could come in here and you could watch Caleb's videos. So you could just click that and it'll take you right to the video. In addition to this resource, which is an index of all the videos from the summer boot camp and a description of what's in each video, you could click here to Caleb's original outline, right? So the course outline for the summer web boot camp. You could click there for it, or you could get the same document with a few more notes from me. So I've added a few notes in here, and I'll illustrate what I mean by that. So one of the things I added in to Caleb's document 
was this, right? So it's a little outline, and uh, it kind of gives you a table of contents. And, uh, and then one of the things which I was looking at just today was uh, the network stuff right here. That's where I left off, networking, right? Just let me see where's the illustration for how I added stuff in there. Servers. <coughs> Well, the, the illustration is the table of contents. What I added in was actually over here, week five, week nine, right here. I added this in on this document today. But, but uh, the point being, you can see how did he teach this course, right? And this, this again corresponds to the videos, but it doesn't link to the videos. So the networking link I thought was good, and maybe it'd be worthy of a quick review. And so with networking, he's looking at like, okay, what, what's the, from web, a web dev perspective, what do we need to know about networking? And so how many people are familiar with the OSI model? You've taken a networking course, you know OSI. So not, not too many people. So that's one of the first things is we have the OSI model. And OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnection Model. So it's kind of a model for networking, and it has these different layers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The physical layer, that's the actual physical connection. Ethernet, right now my computer's connected to Ethernet. That's the physical connection. And then there's data link and network. So notice here IP4 and IPv6, right? So that's internet protocol. So that's the network layer. That's where packets, right, are being broken up. So the way the, the internet works is it's, a, it's not a circuit switch network. It's a packet switch network. So circuit switch, circuit switch board, right? Circuit switching circuit switch phone <coughs> operators. There we go. So old school circuit switching. This is like old school circuit switching. You guys seen this in movies? Right? <laughs> so you want a connection, it's just a physical connection. And if that line gets cut between who you, you are talking with, you, you know, the line connecting you and the person you're talking with gets cut, you're done. Right? So that's a circuit switch network. How many people this is like new information? Circuit switch network. Raise your hand. So then we have a packet switch network. And uh, packet switch network. Let me see what I get with switching. There's a nice image sometimes. <coughs> Packet switching. Let me see what the Wikipedia looks like. All right, I don't like any of these images. <coughs> so packet switching is we take the message and we break it up and uh, we throw it onto the network and then routers route that message to the <coughs> destination and when it gets to the destination it gets reassembled. So that's better because if we look at the original internet the ARPANET was built <coughs> because of nuclear bombs and if uh, LA was talking to Oh, there we go, that's cleaner. If LA was talking to um, Washington, D.C., and it was a circuit switch network, and they were on a line that went through Denver, and Denver got blown up, LA is no longer talking to D.C., right? Circuit switch network. Packet switch network, we throw our information on the, on, onto the network, and it's got routing information, and then routers are like, okay, I got to get this packet to D.C., Right? Denver gets blown up. Can't go through Denver anymore. Let's go through Houston. Right? The network just routes it a different way. So you can blow up cities and your communication can still occur. <laughs> right? So that's, uh, that's packet switching. Circuit switching versus packet switching. Circuit switching has been still around for phones for so long though because it gives you a nice 
even stream. With packet switching, you may you may hit some part where there's a whole bunch of packages coming in at all at once, and it'll slow down as it tries to process all the different packages that's packets that are going everywhere. Whereas with circuit switching, you just have a dedicated line, so you guarantee it'll take this amount of time to get there every time. So that's still used for phones, where you need you need that kind of consistent thing uh, quality to keep your uh, the voice communication good. But for the internet, it's not really needed. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. I appreciate it. Anybody wants to contribute to this conversation, jump in because I know some stuff. I don't know everything. And if I say something slightly incorrectly, correct me. Right? I'm I'm not the expert. I'm somebody who's spent some time doing this, and I know a few things. But if you know something else, jump in. And my background's econ and business. <laughs> So, right, I didn't have the benefit of taking the network class. It's all just like what I've just learned from talking to people and reading things and watching videos. All right, so uh, that's a circuit versus packet. And, uh, and one message, like if I send an email, that email might get broken up into 10 packets. And those 10 packets might take 10 different routes to the destination. And then when they arrive at the destination, those packets get reassembled, right? And, uh, and then I could see my message. So that's, that's, the, that's the internet protocol. And when we're looking at that OSI model, so open systems interconnection model, right? IP internet protocol right here is re responsible for, is IP responsible or TCP, transmission control protocol IP? IP is the addresses, including addressing, routing, and traffic control, reliable transmission of data segments between, which does packets? The network is in packets. So IP would be packets. <clears throat> IP is packets? Yep. Um, TCP and UDP would be network layer up, and uh, TCP just acts as if it's a stream. Packet switching, required packet, IP packets, maybe lost internet <coughs> protocol packets. So uh, IP is the packet level. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. So anyhow, we've got these different levels. And here's IP, Internet, and then TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. So reliable transmission of data segments between points on the network, including segmentation. So this is the packeting part. And then this is a transmission of data, transmission, transmission control, right? Transmission, that makes sense. And then uh, up here, we have HTTP. We have TLS, Transport Layer Security. Yep. Is that right? You're hovering over it. Oh, it's giving me a tooltip, Transport Layer Security, TLS. So that's the new SSL. It used to be SSL and uh, Secure Socket Layer. Is that what SSL stands for? Pretty sure. Secure Socket Layer. SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. There we go. But now it's Transport Layer Security. So here's the Transport Layer, right? But interestingly, TLS is listed under our application. So TLS is below HTTP, even though right there it shows it at the same level. So you have transport, you have HTTP, and TLS kind of falls in between those two. I'm not sure where it belongs. This, by the way, changed from over the summer. Over the summer, HTTP was listed under session. <laughs> so somebody modified Wikipedia and said that's wrong. You know, should be up at that layer. Anyhow, those are just different layers. And in web dev, we are working, you know, basically the TCP layer up to there, right? TCP, HTTP, TLS. So today, if we get far enough, we'll look at doing TLS. So TLS is the new HTTPS, not SSL. And, uh, and there's uh, HTTP, the HTTP protocol, HTTP protocol, protocol, uh, Wikipedia, find 1.1, 1 .1, right, in 1997, and uh, I think we're still using 1.1, or is it 1.2? I think 1.1 1 .1 is. 1.1, 1 .1, right? Yeah. That's what people are using. Yeah. So I'm not sure. The version of HP in common use occurred in 1997, although this was obsoleted by this in 1999. Well, what's 1999's version? Still HTTP 1.1. Yeah, they, just, they fixed errata in a backwards incompatible way, which is annoying. Hmm, what did they fix? <coughs> errata, various just spelling. Just errata? And Got rid of the rats? Mis <laughs> miscellaneous uh, issues. Errata. An error in printing or writing, a list of corrected errors, just 
odds and ends. Mm -hmm. So that's HTTP 1.1. And interestingly, HTTP 2 is on the verge. Right? So we're soon to see HTTP 2. And there's this great article yesterday, which I emailed to myself. Uh, February 21st would have been here. They're getting ready for HTTP 2. So Smashing Magazine. I'll copy this and uh, put it onto our syllabi. And I'll just put it right here. <coughs> so not only is there a lot to wrap your head around, it's all always changing quickly. <laughs> Though HTTP 1.1 has been around since 1999, so how quickly is 17 years? But this is a really great article, and uh, the implications are about performance. And so one of the biggest implications is that with HTTP 1.1, you really wanted to limit the number of your requests because that had a super negative performance impact. With HTTP 2, uh, one connection can handle an unlimited number of requests, and so you no longer need to do that. So with HTTP 1, we might put all of our images onto one big image called a sprite, and then just access different areas on that image. And that way, we've only asked for one thing from the server, or the client only asked for one thing, or the server only had to serve one thing. That's HTTP 1.1. HTTP 2, serve each of those Im images individually. Don't give somebody a 48 megabyte image file when all they need is three images on it. Just give them those three images, right? So there's some pretty big performance changes for how websites are built, and uh, this article talks about that. So kind of interesting. So just sort of looking at some of this stuff. So on the note of HTTP 2, last Thursday, I think, Thursday morning, Go 1.6 came out, and it adds support for HTTP 2 to their, uh, list, to their HTTP library. You would use it the same way, but it will support HTTP 2 uh, protocol if the web browser is using it. So if you update, you get that for free. Yeah, and, uh, and so that's really great because it's going to be more performant. It's based upon a speedy thing that they were doing at Google. So Google had this speedy project that they were working on, and, uh, and then they've rolled in all that stuff from speedy into uh, HTTP2. And uh, I don't know what other server-side languages are doing with HTTP2, but it's just rolled right in to go, and it's accessible right now. And so if you set it up on a server that's able to serve HTTP2, and your clients have browsers that could do HTTP2, so we can look at can I use HTTP2 protocol. 71% of browsers can already use it. And you can see, uh, you know, which ones don't, which ones do. <laughs> right? But that, that's pretty cool. So, you know, basically most of the people in the first world are going to be able to get your your stuff faster. And speed is, is uh, speed is, uh, you know, I don't know, speed is the thing which you live and die by when building websites, getting stuff to people quickly. Because it's like hundreds of nanoseconds will... Just, just look at Google. They're the fastest thing out there. They're uh, the most number one, they're the number one search engine. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I think Google killed it at, at first, because they were just minimal. You didn't have to download all that crap which comes with Yahoo. Right, Yahoo is kind of like the People magazine of search engines, right? Like all this other stuff's coming down, and Google's just like we we specialize in search. That's it. This wasn't even up here when Google first came out. I'm feeling lucky button. I'm feeling hungry. I like that one. I'm feeling wonderful. I'm feeling puzzled. I'm feeling doodly. I want hungry again. <laughs> So a lot of information. That's just my job, pass information on to you. So IP, TCP, HTTP, right? Internet protocol, transmission control protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, internet protocol, transmission control protocol, uh, hypertext transfer protocol. And FYI, if you're using HTTP2, everything has to be HTTPS. Right? You have to do it all secure. 
And, uh, and I've heard that that impacts your page rank, your organic page rank with search engines. Uh, if you have a site that's all HTTPS, that ranks higher than a site that's only some of it's HTTPS or it's all HTTP. So make everything HTTPS. You don't have to worry about sprites anymore. You could serve as many individual files as possible. Deliver the minimal amount of content for every page, right? And, uh, and um, make it HTTPS. Use HTTP2. That's like current best practices right now. 71% of the marketplace can be able to get that. And IPv6 if you can too. Say something about IPv4 versus IPv6 because that's... Uh, IPv4 has basically been running out of IP addresses for the last like 15 years. Um, so you may have had issues with like getting port forwarding set up on routers and such, which are basically a bandage way to try to extend the amount of addresses in IPv4. Um, since you can reuse the same address as long as it's behind a router. IPv6 has got, uh, can hold way more addresses, enough that they can fill like the entire world over like 60 times, I think, currently. So uh, you don't have to worry about uh, port forwarding or any other <coughs> router level issues. And uh, I believe it also affected like transport as well. So similar to HP2, it should be slightly faster due to a few minor changes to how they structure their package, the packets and such. Cool. All right, so last couple of things about this. Exploration of a web request. There's a DNS. How many people know when you talk about web dev, you know what DNS is? How many people do not? How many people aren't raising their hands? So DNS, domain name, uh, system or server? Ah, DNS, web. Domain name, uh, wiki. I think it's domain name, server, domain name, system. But you have domain name, servers, too. All right, so domain name, system is uh, basically a resolver because everything on, everything on uh, the web is a uh, IP address. That's what gives it its location. So mcclouds.com, the IP address is that. So if I go to that IP address, I come to my mom's website, right? And that's the exact same website that comes from here. And so basically, this, when you know IP addresses were hard for people to communicate, like phone numbers, not a big deal, right? We give people our phone number for a long time. That's how phone numbers work. Right? And you'd just be like, hey, I know my best friend's phone number by heart. I know that. Right? <coughs> so, but, you know, hey, what's your, what's your website? 72293140. Cool, man. I'll check it out. That was the, the, the original days. But then what happened with phones? We no longer have to remember people's phone numbers because it's just in your phone and you just tap, oh, the picture and their name and it tiles it for you. Right? So the picture and the name knows the phone number. Yeah, you got the funny sounds. <laughs> the picture in the phone knows the <clears throat> knows the phone number and dials it for you. Same thing here. Uh, this domain name is resolved to this IP address. So it's a domain name system. And there are domain name servers where it's just a big list of the domain name and where is it that that resource lives. McLeods.com. Okay, I'm going to send you over to 72293140. Right? That's the domain name system. So getting that set up is not a part of my DigitalOcean tutorial, but you may remember we were setting in IP addresses everywhere. So if you had purchased a domain name, which costs money, you could have assigned that to your IP, to the IP address of your DigitalOcean server, and then you would be able to anytime you use the IP address in your web browser or in SSH. It would find, it would figure out what the IP address from the domain name server and then use it. And that's its own day or two of learning to figure <laughs> out how to do that. But if you use Google Domains, I don't know, would this show confidential information? Uh, well, I can go there. If you use Google Domains, I'll figure it out later before I show it to you guys. Dig DigitalOcean's got a, a, a nice console in it to assign uh, domain yeah. names. You, get what, you buy your domain name, they give you like a couple like informa uh, password information style things. You give that to DigitalOcean, and they'll take care of registering the the domain name to your server for you. Yeah, 
And, uh, and Google Domains also, as we use App Engine, you can just map this domain right to this App Engine project. Yeah. And Google, you don't have to worry about the passwords. They know their own stuff. Yeah. So that's uh, DNS. And then HTTP, you could use uh, the Net tab. We've already seen that some. You could use the Net tab to explore. <coughs> to explore uh, things about a request. Network tab. All right, you could do these different things here. <laughs> That's a 2005 website. I know it's no longer cool to build with sound. Anyhow, the net tab can help you explore the HTTP requests and the different things that have been requested and sent back. You could click on these to see like headers, preview, response, Cookies, timing, right, for each one. The developer tools in every browser is different. Chrome's got the, the best ones currently, although Firefox is is probably second. Yeah, Chrome learned from Firefox and beat them. Pretty much. Um, you could also use a program called Fiddler. I've never used it. It was just talked about <coughs> at Summer Boot Camp. It wasn't shown at Summer Boot Camp. And so... Uh, Debugging traffic from PC, Mac, or Linux. Ensure the proper cookies, headers, and cache directives. So if you wanted to, you could check that out. And then uh, for TCP, you could use Wireshark, and you, you can expect to inspect TCP uh, traffic. So uh, Caleb shows how to use this. I'm not sure what the capabilities are, but he says it's a, a tool hackers use, too, just to watch what's going over a network. All right, let me just watch the TCP traffic over a network. You can, you can view HTTP, the HTTP parts of the message, too. It sends the entire package from the TCP, any TCP fragment that goes by. It'll give you everything about in it, including the data section, which is the HTTP part. Nice. And we talked about packet switch routing already. And client server versus peer-to-peer. -peer. So client server, clients are connecting to a server. Right, That's the general <coughs> model that we're looking at. Um, clients and servers, clients are kind of like in a restaurant, right? They ask the server for something, the server gets it and brings it back to the client. Here are your french fries, right? But we're saying, hey, give me the home page. Here's your home page, client server model. A peer to peer model allows connections from peer to peer. A peer asks a peer for something. So in that model, the peer can be client or server, depending upon whether they're asking for something or being asked for something. So that's like uh, BitTorrent, right? Where, hey, I'm asking for this, and the server says these people have it, and then they start giving it to you. So it's not the server that's serving you the file. The other peer is serving you the file. So <clears throat> there is a who is deal where you can look up domain information about people, and if it's not private, you can see who owns a certain domain. <clears throat> so you could Google that on your own. So that's just a little bit of information uh, from the Summer Web Boot Camp. And I encourage you to take a look at that link, right? You know, look at this article. It's a good article. And then also take a look at this index of videos and just kind of go through them. And uh, up at the top, you have that link to uh, some additions right there. But you could go in and just see which different videos are interesting to you. All right. Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> so Rio wanted me to mention this for all the uh, people in the classroom, particularly women, but if you're a man, you're welcome to attend too. Rio is one of my colleagues over at Fresno City College, tenured faculty also, and teaches a lot of the tech classes and uh, does a lot of web stuff. Um, so International Women's Day celebration. Uh, Women Tech Makers, powered by GDG, stands for Google Developer Group. And uh, so you could just go to that link on the syllabus, and you can read more about it. <clears throat> and they're going to have a speaker from Google coming down. I'm not quite sure what all they're going to do, but uh, it's basically just a chance to network and get to meet, you know, other women around town who are into tech and programming and, you know, maybe make some contacts for jobs and things like that. It's kind of a cool deal. Uh, make sure you check it out. Right here's the link. I'll leave it up for a week or something. <clears throat> cool. All right, so let's uh, 
start looking at some code and learn some new stuff and I'll just make that its own video.